William and I were talking last night and he was just asking me about how um, things are going in our, our house church that we have here, which by the way, incredible. It's been so good. So thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> we, um, we've really seen like a really tangible anointing of his presence during worship. It has been, and you know what? It's not anything we're doing. I think the Lord is just really pleased by the people that are coming. Um, and so I was telling him last night uh, a little bit about sort of kind of what we're doing uh, and the conviction that I feel about what it means to be the church. And it's really cool to hear some of the stuff the Lord's been speaking to him. Um, and so with all that to say, I know that him and I are kind of tracking without even realizing a lot of the things that God wants to do that are new. I, I know he's mentioned stuff about, you know, calling Levites out of Babylon. And I'm like, yeah, oh, that's so crazy. I literally verbatim had told our group this probably three or four weeks ago. We've been in a whole series this last month on what it means to be the priesthood and what it means to be a holy nation. And so we're wrapping it up this Friday, but a lot of the conversation we've been having is what does it mean to be the church? And why are we Christians? You know, sometimes I'll go around and I'll pick somebody out and I'll say, you know, for example, I'd say, you know, Jamie, Jamie, what does it mean to be a Christian? And why are you a Christian? And so many people get like taken back, like, oh no, like I have to answer in front of everybody. But what we've been doing is trying to get people to, to question, why do we gather? What's the purpose of, of the church? What, is, what does it mean to be the ecclesia, the ones who have been somehow called out, but then also called to assemble? Um, so we've been talking a little bit about that. But as you, I mean, obviously, you know, you guys are about to graduate and move on to maybe not bigger and better, but new, new things. And some of you maybe are coming back. I'm not sure. Um, but one of the things I kind of want to just talk through is um, what does it mean to be the church? And we're going to have just a conversation. But then also I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's easy. I think I remember when I was at Lifestyle teaching, um, I did kind of a teaching on maturation, like the process of becoming like Jesus. And I actually felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to, to share that a little bit today, just a little bit of it. Um, but most of it's going to have to be from memory. So just bear with me. If I teach something that is not in context, just rebuke me later for it, okay? Uh, or send me a message on Facebook Messenger, which so many of you do, which I always love to, to hear your questions. But um, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because, like right now, um, you know, it can go both ways. It can be really easy to grow because you're constantly in an environment that is encouraging you to grow or you're around people that are constantly growing. And so you can kind of glean and receive from, you know, whether they're speakers or pastors or teachers. Um, but what happens when you, you know, are at school every day and you just go to church once or twice a week? Like, how do you actually grow in God? Um, not just you, but as a group, you know, that's one thing we miss in the West is that, it's not just that I need to grow. It's that we need to grow together, right? It's not that I need to be in my word. It's that we need to be in the word together. So I'm just going to invite you in to um, the last like year of having a house church. Are you guys cool with that? And like just what we've seen. And um, one of the things that I've been doing is like intentionally bringing them back to foundational doctrines, like baptism, repentance, being filled with the spirit. What does it mean to be a temple of the Lord? You know, these are sort of, sometimes we have like these ethereal um, perspectives of like, yes, Jesus saved me and he loves me and he lives inside of me. But what does that really mean? You know, like we can, we can adopt that language from, you know, people like Pastor William or Costi or Jenny, but what does it actually mean to you to be the temple of the Lord? You know? Um, and so we've been going through these things and as I'm teaching you know, I usually will randomly have other people teach just to keep, you know, I, it's boring to hear me talk all the time. But one of the things I've specifically been teaching them is very much like elementary principles. And what I'm finding is that the church actually is not doing a great job in discipling people in the way of like Christian doctrine. And so as I've been kind of like teaching through it, I realized in the feedback I get, I always, so whenever I teach on a Friday, I'll teach for about an hour. 
And it seems that people never want to leave the house after I teach. They just literally from like nine to 11, they just, we just sit in a big circle and people just ask questions and we just process and chew as a group. And we kind of like go through the word and, you know, people have questions of, about everything. Um, but what it's really cool is it's cool to see that people are, and maybe this is just me, I'm not projecting, people are over um, the paradigm of what church is in the West. And they're, they're recognizing that um, what we're doing is not enough. And it's not that we need to do more. It's that we need to do things differently. Um, and so we've been talking through it a lot. And so I, I probably will stop processing with you and we'll just kind of get into some of it. So what happens is in the gospels, we have this, this record of Jesus being found in the temple, obviously. Um, and, and Mary comes to him and says like, like, where, what the heck dude, you know, um, where have you been? And he's like, don't you know, like, like, come on, mom, like get with the program, you know? Uh, don't you know, like I would be about my father's business and um, which, which we miss it, but I don't know, maybe, maybe Jenny can answer this question, but if you had lost Peyton for three days, you're probably high anxiety, stress, um, not sleeping at night. You know, I don't, I don't know what it may be. Maybe you're like, Lord, I need this break, you know? <laughs> you know, sometimes, but no, I, I'd probably think that I was a horrible mother. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so, and so Mary comes to Jesus and she's like, Hey, what's, where have you been? And he has this really kind of arrogant response to her. Uh, we don't think about that. We don't think about that. Actually, like Jesus had a little bit of an attitude. That's not saying that that was sin, but, and in his youth and in his arrogance, he's like, didn't you know, mother, that this is what I'm about. And then like the gospel goes silent on his life for about 18 years. And we actually don't hear anything about him um, for those 18 years until we get to like the wedding of Cana. And here we have again, his mother seeking him, but this time it's to do something, right? This time it's about to be a moment for him to be about his father's business. And many of you may recall, remember his, his answer to her was, it's not my time. And so we see this shift in the gospel, like in the historical timeline of Jesus' life from arrogance to humility. Wow. Um, and the reason that the gospel writers, man, I even feel like his presence on that, just saying that like the reason the gospel writers are silent is because it's their way of invitation to you into your process of becoming humble, right? So so we see the process of maturing even in the life of Jesus from arrogance to humility. But the thing is, is that I love, I love the fact I, I, I hate, I won't use that word. I very, I, I dislike the fact that we don't have anything from 12 to 30, <laughs> like historically recorded. I mean, there's some, there's some one-off books that people you know have written, but I don't suggest them. But uh, anyways, w one of the things though, that I love about the wisdom of, you know, I'm not sure if Jesus ever told them what happened during those years or if they chose not to record it. Um, but it's literally to invite us as followers of Jesus into our own process of maturing and becoming like him, which has a lot to do with seasons of silence and solitude. The seasons where it feels like it's the monotony and the mundane of working and raising children and not having a ministry, not being well known, not traveling, you know, um, but our hearts literally like to just grow. You know, we know that Jesus was a stonemason. Some translations say carpenter, but it's mostly stonemason. And though he likely worked with wood, but I mean, he worked most of his life, which is crazy to think about. You know, when I think about the charismatic church, I think about a church that um, doesn't want to work usually. Um, they want to be a ministry the whole life. And prayer is just something they do, you know, leading up to the conference or what, whatever it may be, right? Whereas Jesus functions as like he works most, most of his life. He's at his ministry for about three, three and a half years. And now he lives to make intercession. Like he lives in the place of prayer for us. And how his way of navigating 
his own life and ministry is so contrary to what many of us feel called to, right? Like ministry. Whereas like Jesus worked most of his life as a nobody, you know, hidden in silence and solitude. And so, um, but one thing we do know, which is crazy to think about, um, Luke summarizes his kind of idea at the end of, at the end of chapter two, which he didn't have chapter two. We all know that. Yes, Joey, there wasn't chapters and verses. Um, but he kind of summarizes his, his frame of reference for chapter two, which is really to talk about the birth and like boyhood of Jesus. But he ends like the scene in the temple with, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, which is so crazy to think about like that. God became a man and that he grew in wisdom and he grew in favor and he grew in stature meaning he, he grew in maturity. That's like that word, right? So, so you're left with no excuses. Like you have to grow. You have to mature. You have to grow in wisdom. And when you do those things, you will naturally grow in favor with God and man, right? Um, and literally stature in Greek means maturity. So if you see that word stature in your whatever translation you have, it just means maturity. Um but Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about Jesus' life, and it says that, and you can correct me later, but in Hebrews 5, it talks about how, and although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, because being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. What's really interesting to think about is that Jesus was the way of salvation. We get that. That's why he came, right? Okay. Now, again, the whole thing I'm talking about right now is just like the process of becoming like Jesus. Okay. So just bear in mind with me <laughs> because what I want you to walk away from the school with is that God has done everything in this school up until today for a reason. It wasn't because you paid tuition. It wasn't because um, William and Emily are so amazing and Jenny and Tanner are so amazing, and though they are. The reason that you are here right now is because your steps have been preordained that you would walk in them fully. So what God has been doing in you in this school isn't just an end to itself. So you can look back one day and say, wow, remember school of habitation. Wasn't that so special? No, 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 no. Like the school of habitation was bread, but today's a new day. Today's a new day to feast on a new thing. Right. Um, and so what he's starting in you at school of habitation isn't so that you can build um, a museum to those encounters with the Lord. Like the movement of God should never become a museum. He's a living active being. So it's great to have like history and artifacts, but if you're not constantly growing and building upon that, what's the point? Okay. So my goal is just to encourage you in that. Is that okay? Can I just like get thumbs up? Like the cheesy like Zoom thumbs up? Thanks. Okay. You awesome. Know, you like commentary, um, Joey. You like talking back. So I'm going to talk back to you real quick. Um, when you said- Yeah, go for it. Go for it. You brought up the Hebrews and I had already looked it up because that verse has always stood out to me and I love it. So the Greek word for obedience. Um, so he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And you're like, well, how, why would Jesus have to learn obedience? But it's awesome because the other words for obedience also are submissiveness and compliance. And so you mm. wouldn't think, and so what you're saying about him at 12 compared to when you see him again, you know, at the wedding and such a change in him, but he learned compliance. He learned submissiveness, obedience through the things he suffered in those years. And so that's an interesting uh you know, you have scripture to back up the thought of the difference between at 12 and then when he's at the right. wedding. Yeah. One of the things, thank you for, for commenting on that. Also, if there's a bed on the floor, don't think that we are like child abusers. Okay. My wife's redoing my uh, daughter's room. So I'm, I'm sure Katie would like me to comment on the fact that we're getting her a new bed. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> um, yes. I, one thing I think we don't think about when we think about Jesus is that he is a model and a prototype, yet he's king and Lord. He's also our brother, right? Like I was recently having this conversation with somebody and they were like, Lord Jesus, we love you. You're such a great father. And uh, we were talking on Friday and I said, well, Jesus is not our father. He's our brother. He's our high priest. He's our Lord. He's our king. 
but he's also our sibling because he teaches us to pray our father, which means that we share the same father. So with Jesus being a king and a high priest and our Lord and our brother, he's also our prototype for what it means to truly be human, which means that when we read something about Jesus, learning obedience, learning to be submitted to certain things in his life, it's a clue from the gospel writers that, hey, guys, hey, readers, this is your invitation as well. Like we don't just get to read about Jesus's life and say, man, wasn't he so awesome? We should be reading and gleaning and feeling encouraged that the fact that there's a high priest right now who mediates on our behalf, but you're also the priests who mediate on others' behalves, right? Like there's a king that sits on the throne of grace, but you're also by grace encouraged to go to that throne and sit with him. So like Jesus is, he's a model for how we are to, function and think about the world we live in even now. That's why it's called like the way of Jesus because he, he doesn't just like tell us where to go. He leads us there by way of example and embodiment. That's why it's, you know, become like him. Why? Because it's possible, right? Like nobody sets a standard that it, you can't meet, but grace has enabled us to get there. So, um, but I want to, I want to move on. Um, Dallas Willard summarizes discipleship, if I can remember correctly. He says um, that basically discipleship is, is a place of spiritual maturity, right? Like it's a place you get to when you become mature. And what happens, he says, is spiritual maturity um, is basically the place where a person who has decided that the most important thing about life is to do what Jesus has told them to do. And to constantly have to, you know, realign the affairs of their life to do what Jesus has called them to do, which means you don't get to get distracted, which means that though you're excited about something, it doesn't matter. That that exciting thing doesn't mean that Jesus has called you to do it just because it's exciting or it's shiny. Like to be a disciple is to constantly have to sift through temptation and distraction and the good things in order to achieve what is possible in him, right? Um, and so we think about like even Adam and Eve in the scene of the two trees in the garden, the one of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil and the one of life. It's like, man, God put a tree that was good. Like it, it had goodness on it. It was the knowledge of good. But the thing is, is that the one who created it gets to define what's good for them and what's bad for them. Even though it was good, it was bad for them. And so that, that aspect of like us, when we approach him as our rabbi, king, lord, brother, whatever you want to call him, we have to approach him with the openness to say, um, where are you calling me to go and who are you calling me to become? In the midst of all the good things that the church is doing, in the midst of all these opportunities that are happening, what do you want from me? And most times, I'm not saying every time, most times, He'll lead you to the place of silence and solitude to where it doesn't really look that exciting. It's like, hey, guess what? You've just finished school of habitation. Now let's go work. <laughs> you know? Now it's time to pay some bills. Now it's time to go do the normal things in life. But that, just like Jesus, is where you're going to be formed into the image of God. And those are the more important. I'm telling you right now, what you do outside of school of habitation will be more important than what's happened to you inside of the school of habitation because you're taking your information. I think of it this way, right? Like you're taking in information this whole school year and you're learning how to like apply it to your life, which is great. But the, the place of discipleship is taking information, moving to application and then moving to transformation. So the goal is like, it's like a three tiered thing, right? Like you're taking all the things that everybody's teaching you and you're like, Lord, like I'm applying it. I'm getting up early. Like I'm doing all these things. And that's great. But it has to lead unto transformation because that really is the key of what it means to be a disciple. Is that making sense? Are you guys good with this? Okay. I know there's a little bit of lag time. So yes. um, one of the things I'm going to, Jenny, remind me to send you this chart I created last year for, for LCU. I won't, I won't do it now, but there is this really good book. I can't remember what the book's called. Um, but essentially, the, these these two like people had studied cultures and companies. 
um, and specifically within the church and ministry. And they figured out like the journey to becoming like Jesus happens actually in stages. Like it's a process. It's an ongoing thing, right? Um, we, we know that the word says that he's perfected forever those whom he's sanctifying, meaning that sanctification in the Greek is active. It's ongoing. It's a process. So it means that like I get to be more like him tomorrow than I am today because his mercy's new tomorrow. There's more grace tomorrow. There's more, there's more bread. There's fresh manna tomorrow. So that's why Paul can say we move from glory to glory. Why? Because we're constantly growing into the glory of who he is, you know? Um, but in, in, in this chart that I'll make sure you guys get, they, they explain that there's like stages of faith, right? So most of us, like when we first get saved, we have this like um, cognizant awareness of like God is real, right? Like maybe he healed you or maybe he, somebody in the church had a prophetic word for you or you during worship, you encounter his presence. And so you, you, you're, you're not necessarily saved, but you have this immediate recognition that what the heck is that? Like God is definitely real. Right. Um, and then they talk about like the next stage of faith would be sort of like discipleship. So instead of just being like in awe of God, now you get to learn about who he is. Okay. But then you, you, you progress and you go into productivity. So instead of just learning, now you're applying. Okay. Um, most people in the church will hit the wall at application. They will actually not, I'm telling you right now, most people that right now in this moment that are learning about the Lord and they're excited um, and they apply, they're applying certain things and that's great. Most of them hit a wall. Actually, everybody hits a wall. Few make it through the wall to where they become completely transformed. I don't know why there's balloons, but there's balloons. <laughs> um, you, just, you just broke through a wall, Joey. You broke through a wall. Dude, Congratulations. You know what? <laughs> You know what? That I think awesome. Kevin's celebrating right now, so <laughs> that's fine. Um, oh. I'm going to take it as the Lord's affirmation, uh, even if somebody accidentally clicks something. Um, so what happens is most people hit a wall, and that wall is reality. So I would say most people hit that wall in their late 20s, early 30s, because they start to realize that one, and I'm not going to get into all this today. I mean, we could later, but most people start getting into their thirties or their late twenties and they start to realize that I'm not as healthy or as free as I thought I was. And most of that happens when you get in a relationship with somebody else and you get married and you have children and you start realizing like, you're not actually that great at life. <laughs> and it yeah. takes, it takes somebody else getting to know you in a way that your pastors will never know you to tell you, you have some issues in your life and you need to work on this. And so what happens um, is that we, we have to reassess and reevaluate. Like, okay, I love the Lord. I've had history with the Lord, but now I'm, and I've served the Lord. I've served the church, right? I volunteer. I'm do, I tithe. I do all these things for the church. Um, and I have passion and zeal and wisdom, but the wall is called reality. And then reality hits you. And Willard has this great quote. He says, reality is what you run into when you realize you're wrong. You know? um, and we all hit reality at some point. What happens to most people that keeps them stagnant from moving on is that they suffer from egos um, or dignity, right? So like their pride gets hit and they suffer with guilt of like, well, I'm not as free as I thought I was. And, or maybe you were raised in a very cold culture and your parents taught you how to perform and be a high achiever at an early age. And now you realize like you're actually not achieving anything. You're hitting a wall and like, who am I becoming? Like, what do I do with my life? Um, or maybe like a people pleaser. And you can't bear the thought of not being in around people all day, weekly. And you don't know how to be alone, you know. Um, and people get caged in this. But the, the key is, is that to not be caged when you hit a wall in life. When, when, when life actually becomes life. Like, I don't know how to say this in a way to like be loving, but like, Sometimes when we come into the Christian faith, we are sold a lie about the Christian faith that everything is just going to be perfect. And life is now, you know, I get to sit on a cloud with the Holy Ghost and it's just, oh, it's beautiful. And it's always funny, like when I have people over, usually it's the college students who are like, 
life is just incredible, man. Like I'm just loving Jesus. And it is, don't get me wrong. Like life is a gift. Right. Um, and then they hit a wall and that wall for them is like having to find a job. Right. And you're like, come on, buddy. Like <laughs> this isn't that hard, but it's because they've never been through suffering. They've never had to contend for healing. Um, they've never had to learn how to be alone. They're constantly around others. Right. You know, Bonhoeffer has this great quote in his book, Life Together. He says, um, there are two people that every Christian should be aware of. One is the Christian who is always alone and never with people. Right. And the other one who is always with people and can never be alone. Right. Um, and I would say that to you, constantly be aware of the people that can't balance. Like I have to be alone to grow, but I also have to be with others, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so moving on, what happens is, most, and, and I say this from experience, most people um, that are in our lives right now that are very passionate, that are in our 20s and we're young, um, a lot of them don't make it. And I'm not saying this, I'm not prophesying. I'm not like cursing anybody. What I'm saying is most people fail because they haven't been taught how to break through. They haven't been taught that it's possible to, to suffer and come out alive. And help and come out healthy. They haven't been taught like to be alone is a good thing. To be rejected by your family is a great thing. To face persecution at work is a good thing. And it has all, it's unto something. Um, what happens is, is people go inward and start questioning who they are. Um, instead of realizing like it's not to go inward, it's to allow God to explore like maybe there's a new way to surrender. And maybe there's like just because I've suffered doesn't mean that. I, that I'm wrong or just because, you know, um, my family raised me in this way or my community rejected me because of that. I didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but God's actually inviting me into a greater level of discipleship. That's where the church has, I think we've struggled a lot is, is telling people when I'll just say this, when all hell breaks loose in your life, it's God's invitation to you to formation. It's literally a divine. I was just talking to somebody this morning. And he said, I feel like I'm in this season of divine discontentment and I don't know what to do. And I said, no, th- it, it's not just divine discontentment. Like God is inviting you to a divine invitation. Yeah. And if you press in, the formation that's going to happen is greater than what happens in a conference. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. um, it can't just be transformation when Corey Russell's preaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God will use it. For, in order for it to be true transformation... It should transform your everyday life, not just when you register for habitation. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens is, is, and I'll kind of um, summarize what they, what they say here, is they say like, you, you break through the wall, you allow God to kind of expose um, your pseudo self. And essentially like the person that you've been pretending to be for your 20s and early 30s, God actually confronts you by way of suffering and rejection and all this stuff. And he confronts the pretend you to get to the real you. And once you end up understanding like who you truly really are, you're free to not just love yourself, but your neighbor. And when you learn, I'm I'm telling you right now, I have experienced more freedom in realizing like I'm not that important. And I've loved just genuinely trying to celebrate and disciple other people because I think they're more important and they're cooler, there has been such a freedom in my life to know that like, I'm not creating followers of myself. I'm trying to create disciples of Jesus. And when I realize like I've broken through the wall in my life, Kate has, so many of us have, right? We all have our story. That true transformation isn't just me loving myself. It's loving the people around me to serve them, right? So what happens is we see Jesus's maturity. We see him go from serving himself like don't you know that this is my role i'm going to be about my father's business to him at 30 being like no 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 i'm serving my father now in a way that i don't have he hasn't given me the green light to move yet and that shifting of like we stop serving ourselves and we start serving other people around us you know um and what does jesus say like they're going to know your mind by how you love each other so let me just, I just want to like kind of push through this. Are we okay? Is everybody doing all right? So good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, 
Listen, listen, Jamie, I'm winging it, right? I I, uh, I really felt like the Lord was like, you're not going to take notes for this one. So I'm like, all right. Um, so anyway, so, so pushing on, um, we, we, one of the biggest things that we have bumped into here um, in East Tennessee is like the spirit of religion. And beyond like the spirit of religion, it's like a spirit of consumption. It's like the church... Um, is very diabetic here. They're very, they're very, you know, they're fat. They're, they're, they're lazy. I'm not saying people, I'm saying like in like a hypothetical thing, you know, um, people assume that they're doing better than they actually are. Um, and their consumption of Christianity is church attendance. And that's probably been the biggest thing we've had to bump up against is, you know, I was just the other night, I'm inviting you into my life. The other night, we've taken up uh, pickleball out here. Like pickleball has taken over the whole world, actually. Anyways, yeah. we so we play like two, three times a night. Like if you know, Lord, Lord permitting, we ha- have time to do so. Um, and a friend of ours, um, he actually was an LCU student. I don't know if he, anybody knows who Connor Bailey was. Uh, he just moved here last week, actually, to be a part of our house church. And so we're out playing pickleball, right? And so we end up being put into this church tournament unbeknownst to us this group of guys were like hey we need another team can you guys join this like little tournament we're playing tonight we're like yeah sure we'll do that um and so we're you know we're playing we're getting to know everybody and um and there's a few guys that we know really well that go to other churches and so people are like conversing we're talking and and the question comes up like oh hey what church do you go to and the guy's like well i go here i go there and they're like oh man it's so awesome such a cool church and and then it comes around to like uh, Connor and then they're like, you know, uh, what church do you go to? He's like, oh, I just go to a house church. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And I'm like standing next to Connor. I'm like, you could tell them what it is. Like tell them it's the garden or something, dude. And so they go, <laughs> they go, and he goes, yeah. And he leads it and he just points to me and they're like, oh, you, so you lead a house church and you could just see like the, the conception and the idea of house church here in East Tennessee is just not a thing. Right. And they're like, so what is that? Like, how is that? How do you do that? And I'm like, guys, well, have you read like the New Testament? Yeah. You know, like we're just the house church. <laughs> um, I said, I said, you could call it a fellowship night. Like we fellowship, but really people, you know, we disciple people, all that stuff. And what I found out in that moment was like, um, not that we're doing it right. See, the easy part is to, to deify what we're doing and say, well, this is God and to demonize what they're doing. That's, that's not healthy at all. But what I realized is like, the reason a lot of people aren't growing is because um, they're consumers of Christian, of the Christian life. They don't work. They don't move towards contribution. See my kids, they are consumers, man. If I tell you that they consume, they consume. I'd show you my bill from Sam's club. Like my kids are just consumers. Now my two oldest are getting to the place where they move from being consumers um, to recognize that they that now they're in the challenging stage of life, right? They challenge everything um, because they realize like, I'm just not going to get, I'm just not going to do whatever mom and dad tell me to do, right? Like when they were consumers, they just did whatever we told them. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. And you realize like a lot of people in the church are babies still because of that. They just do whatever the pastor tells them or they believe whatever the pastor or teaching team teaches them, right? And they don't actually think for themselves. But then you get to the place where people start challenging teachings or they start challenging things which is a good and bad thing so for my kids it's a bad thing it's a very bad thing right like stop challenging me just last night like reese she's gonna be she's gonna be nine in january gosh it's so crazy to even say that she is working on her times tables so she comes into my room and she's like dad i need your laptop doesn't tell me what it's for i need your laptop i'm like it's seven o'clock at night no you don't she said i need to do my times table they said just right, like, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm, I'm multiplying uh, by 12s or whatever it was. And so I was like, well, just get a paper and pencil, dude. Like, you don't need my laptop. Like, I've got homework to do. I don't have time for this. And she starts getting emotional. And she's like, oh, I have to have the laptop. And she's just challenging, right? And then um, I said, Reese, up until like 40 years ago, what do you think people did to learn math? Like, they had paper and pencils. Um, and stones maybe (laughs) back in the day. And so she was like, no dad, I'm not going to learn if I can't do it on your laptop. So my wife's a sucker. She, she gave it to her. I was like, whatever. So 
So this morning I wake up to a post-it on the counter, this, this long post-it that says, Dad, I'm so sorry. I ended up doing all my multiplication on paper and it's way easier to memorize. And so I, I talked to her this morning and I said, I was like, sis, it's that easy. You just have to trust me. Like, I was just trying to help you. I was like, now you can take your paper on the bus. You have an extra half hour to study versus like my laptop ain't going to school with you. So anyways, I say all that to say is like, as Christians, we move from a place of consumerism to a place of certainty where we realize like, oh, okay, this is fine. Like we're, we're learning new things. But then as we learn, we start to challenge because we realize we have like autonomy and we don't trust things anymore. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it keeps you from being brainwashed and becoming a cult. So that's a good thing. But in an unhealthy way, it, it causes you to become very individualistic to where you actually don't, never trust anything or anybody and you become just your own source, right? Um, but the goal is to move from infancy to adulthood, which what, what does a true disciple do? They contribute to everyone around them. You know, I remember when I came a few months ago, we talked about the good shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Why? Because I, I lay down my life for my sheep. I actually, I actually sacrifice what I feel entitled to in order so that others may find life and life abundantly. And that same invitation is the invitation to what it means to be a Christian. Like, um, does that, so I hope kind of that makes sense. Now, one of the big things, too, is the church. Um, we don't have practical resources for how people can actually grow. We're very, like, ethereal, right? Like, we treat topics like we're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about, for example, my group. I said, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you for the next four weeks on what it means to be a priest. And people are like, we're going to learn about that for four weeks. I'm like, we could do it for 12 weeks. You know, I said, but, like, your mental capacity is probably not there after working all week long. Um but giving people practical tips on how do we grow into God's image? Um, well, one of the things is we recognize that um, we're already like him, but there's such a, a vastness to who he is that not only are we constantly exploring who the Lord is, but we're constantly discovering and becoming more like him. Because, And I think that's a tension point that we have, and maybe I'll just – be the first one to acknowledge like we have to hold the, the, a lot of our Christian life guys is holding in tension. These two truths that we're already like him yet. We still need to become like him um, that Jesus um, is a healer, but still people still die of sickness and disease right, yeah. that the kingdom of God is at hand, mm -hmm. but it has yet to arrive in its fullness. Yeah. One, one thing that disciples spiritually healthy people do is that they know how to keep hold in tension to truth without rejecting one at the cost of the other. Right. Um, and so it's, it's recognizing, like, I think I asked, I think I asked LCU like two years ago. I, um, I said, how do you become like Jesus? And I said, anybody stand up and just yell it. And, uh, and I can't remember what everybody said. Um, and people are like, you know, you love him. And I'm like, well, that's a great answer. It's not wrong. <laughs> love Jesus. Yeah, sure. Uh, people are like, spend time with Jesus. I was like, yeah. And I said, but how do you, how do you actually like become like him over a long period of time? Um, and I just told them, I gave them the clue. I said, you, you make a plan. You actually plan. And for some of us, that seems like, well, isn't that works? No. Like the grace of God is not opposed to you making an effort. It's opposed to you thinking that somehow you deserve it because you've earned it. So we can actually make a plan just like anything else in our life. Like, how did you get to school today? You followed the plan that you had all along, right? Whereas now it's second, it's second nature. You, you get up and I hope to God you, you probably brushed your teeth and, um, you know, if you're dirty, you took a shower or whatever it may be. Um, but you got to school today without even probably thinking about all the things you had to do to get to school. Cause it's just second nature now. And the same way in the Christian life, like we can become like him constantly. If we would just develop a habit of being disciplined because um, discipline is delight. It's not duty like to, to discipline ourselves and to practice spiritual disciplines. You will get to the place 
where it becomes second nature and you let go of trying to do everything perfect and you recognize like the goal is not perfection. The goal, the goal is embodiment. Okay. Um, what I mean by that is, I mean, uh, I was recently, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring this down and then maybe we can ask questions, talk about the church a little bit, whatever it may be. Are you guys okay with that? Yep. Okay. Um, I had like several ideas for today, but as I'm talking, I just, I'm just going to go with what I feel. Um, so in my, in my current role, like for work, cause I actually like have a job, uh, as much as I was telling, I was telling Lauren last night, we were talking, we were talking about a bunch of stuff, but I said, you know, um, I love working, but there's also a side of me. It's like, I never want to work again. You know, maybe it's just me. Um, like why couldn't my parents have invented something, you know, and I just have like, you know, this inheritance and I just get to spend time with Jesus and teach people the word of God all day, you know? Um, no, but so we were, we were, we were laughing about that of like, there's still work to do in the world and society and culture. Like Christians have to do stuff. You know, we can't just sit in a church all day. We have to go and be the church. Um, but in my role, um, it's a really interesting role. I, I get to spend essentially like I, I shepherd and pastor, um, these like 20 something year olds in New York city who have, um, they're all from Ivy leagues, right? So the Harvard's, the Princeton, the Yale's, all that stuff. Um, and they're all in different fields and they all genuinely love the Lord, but feel a very deep conviction that they are called to go into society and culture, um, in the name of Jesus type thing. And so some of these kids, man, are like, you know, 25, 26. Some of them are like my age, 30, 31, you know, Harvard Law School graduates, um, MIT type graduates, all, all this stuff. But they genuinely are on fire for Jesus. But they don't have an ethic for how to become like him. Like they feel like they're on mission. They feel like they have like this trajectory to get there. Like they know what they want to do, but they don't have either – a shepherd to help lead and guide them or an understanding for why it is that they even feel like they feel called to, you know, whether it's Goldman Sachs or Google. Right. Um, and so my role really, which is crazy to think about um, is I'm just essentially paid to um, spend time with them and to help them navigate the Christian life, <laughs> which is super cool. Um, and so a few weeks ago I was in New York and I, and I go, about once a month, but I was in New York and I had this meeting with this kid who graduated like top of his class at Harvard. Um, super smart kid. And he's in, um, in finance and like investment banking. Uh, and he's, I think he's like 26 or whatever. And so we're walking through central park. I know this feels like a Hallmark movie, but <laughs> it's cause it did. We're walking through central park and the leaves are starting to change and, you know, we got a coffee and we're just talking and, um, and he, we're, we're talking about, um, he has a lot of frustration with the modern day church, right? He's like, you know, um, this and that and that and this. And so we're talking and we get to a point where he's like, um, I want to become like Jesus. And I want to grow into the image of, of what he has for me. I just don't know how, you know. And I told him, I said, um, I said, you know, for me, I said, I love theology. I don't worship it, but I love it. I feel like what a gift it is that we have brains that we can grow in knowledge about God, right? Like, like not just knowledge of like stupid dad facts, like, Hey, do you know, like chickens don't lay whatever, like, you know, like we have brains that have the ability to grow into the knowledge of God. Like God gave us this thing and now we get to grow and explore who he is. And I said, that's how I feel about theology. Right. So like, as I learn, I just become more fascinated by who God is. Not like, hey, I want to I want to learn so I can put a bunch of things at the end of my name if I ever write a book, right? And I told him, I said, and he said, um, so what does that look like in your life? And I said, my conviction is that if it's if it's true theology, it can be embodied. Meaning that I'm not just learning things to learn them. Because that there's no point in learning, guys. Like if you're at school of habitation, 
just to have a notebook full of notes. That's not the goal of why God puts you here. For me, it's you, 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 you get, you get a theology so that you can actually embody that in the real world. So we would say Jesus is perfect theology. That's because Jesus embodied what the father was like in the world as a human being. Like he didn't just sit in a temple and teach. Like he actually lived out perfect theology. One of the things I'm thinking through and I kind of land this specifically is the other night we were talking and um, somebody had a really good question. They said, um, what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? What does that mean? And she, um, it was, I thought it was a great question. Um, she said, you know, if everybody's created in the image and likeness of God, then um, why are we all doing, you know, different things? Some people do evil and all that stuff. And I said, um, it was just one of those questions where you're like, that's a really good question. <laughs> And, and as they're asking it, you realize like, this is going to take 25 minutes to explain. Um, and so what I told her, as I said, uh, her name's Rosanna. I said, um, I said, let's say for example, that you are somebody um, who gets a job working at a local high school or university. And your job is like, you're the receptionist of the office. Okay. So I want you to all to imagine yourselves as you're working on, let's say a college campus. Okay. But you work in an office as a receptionist. So if I were to come up to you one day and I caught you in a grocery store and I said, Hey, Pastor Jenny, what do you do? What do you do for work? And you say, I'm in education. I would say, Oh, cool. Like, what do you mean? And you'd say, well, I work at a school. Um, and I say, Oh, so do, what do you teach? You're in education. You're like, no, I don't, I don't teach anything. I I'm, I'm a receptionist. You know, I'm like a clerk. I would say, Oh, so you're in education, but you actually don't function as an educator. So there's a, di there's a difference there. So what I was telling Rosanna is like all humans are created in the image and in the likeness of the Lord, but not all function in the way that he's created us to function. All of us though, have the capacity to function as God's image and likeness. But few of us ever actually do it because we, we get careless with our spiritual life. Um, we neglect fasting and praying. We neglect gathering together, spending time alone with the Lord um, because we're so used to just people doing everything for us. Um, and that was one of the big teaching things that we've gone through in this season at our house church is that um, the, the priesthood, we always, we always think that like Moses or Aaron and the priesthood or even David, right? Um, that they're an inferior priesthood because we have Jesus now, who's the priest through the order of Melchizedek. And I don't want to get into all that. But, but most, the priesthood of the old is not inferior to the new. It's nothing like the new. It's not even close to what we have now. And so I was telling our group that like people are always like, you know, Jesus is the new Moses. No, 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 no. Moses, <laughs> Moses is nothing like Jesus. Like we're, we're, we're comparing apples to oranges, man to God right? Like it, it's not that the old's inferior to the new. It's that the old is nothing like the new in the sense that now we have a priest who functions in grace, not law. Now we have a priest who has the ability to bring his entire nation up the mountain, whereas Moses couldn't. Now we have a priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness. He doesn't get frustrated like Moses when people haven't learned their lesson. So we, we and I was telling them, um, and this, I'll kind of tie this in together, but I said, as disciples, as, as the holy nation, as the royal priesthood, we have to recognize that we have a high priest who has called all of us up, meaning that we all have the ability to become like him if we would do the hard work of working on ourselves. Like Jesus, I told them, what you lack in the Lord, I told them, is your fault. If you don't have what you want in your life, not saying monetary or materialization things, but if you're like, man, I don't feel like I'm having the breakthrough, like mental breakthrough, or I'm not having breakthrough of forgiveness. I told them that's your fault, that the Lord has already done his job. And now he's given you grace and his spirit lives inside of you. So what is your excuse not to have it? Like 
you have as much of him as you want of him, but it's up to you. And so that helped a lot of our group because what they recognize is I am not their Moses. Like Pastor Jenny and Costi and William are not your Moses. The priesthood of Moses has been done away, meaning that I'm not to go up to the mountain and hear from the Lord for you. You're going to come up with me and we're going to hear him together. And we're going to experience him together. We're going to explore him together. But when we all stand before the Lord, I'm not going to stand before the Lord as, as, a, as like your pastor and you're all going to be there. I'm going to stand before him as a priest and as a disciple, and he will judge me based on what I did with that. So I was telling our group, like, we have to live in a way now as disciples to recognize that, like, if the goal is to become like Jesus and he's given me the capacity to be his image and likeness, and he's given me everything that pertains to life and godliness already, he's put his Holy Spirit inside of me without measure. And now I'm his temple and his priest. Like, why am I always waiting for other people to help fix the problem? Like, why am I always waiting for breakthrough to come from so-and-so who's going to visit our church? Or, or why am I always like waiting for God to do all of these things in my life now that I'm in my 30s, what I'm learning is I probably could have had a lot of breakthrough and victory in my 20s, but I wasn't disciplined enough. Um, and I would always try to blame where I wasn't on everybody else or what I didn't have on, well, maybe the Lord just doesn't want me to have that yet um, in this way of victory or whatnot. Um, so when we think about discipleship, one of the things just kind of like a practical maybe maybe takeaway would be to um, to become like Jesus is, is to recognize that you have to let go of your image in order to adopt his, right? That's the hard one for a lot of people, <laughs> especially if people feel like they're gifted and anointed is, um, is that not everything you touch has to be yours and not everything that you create has to look like you. Um, and that not everybody you lead um, has to follow you every second of the day. Like you have to let go of fear of not being influential or important or, you know, inspirational. Or maybe maybe like for some of you, if you feel called to teach the Bible or, or start a church, whatever it may be, one of the fears that you're going to have to let go is the fear um, that you're not going to leave a great enough legacy. That's a huge one that we miss. Like nowhere, nowhere in scripture are we called to leave a legacy. What we're called to leave is an inheritance to our children, but also to embody God in our lifetime and to be his image in the earth and then to go and be with him. Like that's literally our calling. Like Count von Zinzendorf, like I don't have time to talk about it, but he has this good quote. He says um, basically that, you know, he, in a nutshell, he says, you know, we should all live, you know, godly lives and then die and just be forgotten about. <laughs> and I'm like, that is so freeing to think about. Like, I don't, I don't have to make sure like whatever I start, you know, um, is successful. I know it will be if I just take care of my children well, if I disciple my kids well, regardless of what happens to me. I just like you think about Jesus, right? Like he pours into these 12 men. Um, they didn't even have it all together. Not only when he died, but when he resurrected and not only that, but even when he sent them out, they didn't have it all together. And so we would be like, Jesus didn't leave that great of a legacy because man, they just didn't even get it. And you're thinking like, no, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like Jesus realized that he did what the father had him do in his time. And then he said, okay, now it's the role of the spirit to come and take over, which is so cool to think about like how God operates as a team. Anyways, so one like practical step for you guys would be to let go of any expectation, fear, or this sense of control that you have to have your life in a certain thing by this certain time and have this many kids by this certain age or have this much in your savings account by the time you're this old. Let go. Like let go of expectations that the Lord hasn't put on you and recognize that all he's a, he's expecting from you is for you to embody who he is. And that's what you'll be judged on. Right. Um, also 
So let go, I would say, to recognize that you're not perfect. Um, you're, you're not that important or cool. That's what my kids tell me now. Like, dad, you're, I told Reese the other day, I said, you know, I got, I had, I got like these Nike shoes. I'm like, I just need some new shoes. I was like, Reese, aren't they cool? And she goes, yeah, but you're like, not that cool. And I was like, oh, that one hit me in the gut. I'm like, this whole time I was like walking around thinking I'm so cool. And then Kate's like, yeah, you, you know, you're kind of nerdy. You're not that cool. You know, I'm like, all right, guys, thanks for, uh, thanks. <laughs> but, but honestly, like the beautiful thing about having children and a spouse is that they, you get to hear your limitations. You get to be made aware of the fact that you're, you're not as great as you think you are, or you don't have everything together as much as you think you do. Um, so letting go would be my first encouragement of fear, expectation, etc. Two would be to, to embrace, but also surrender the fact that there's limitation. Like you have limitation. You're not a machine that you're growing. So be patient with yourself and embrace the fact that you're not called to be me. And I'm not called to be you. I'm called to be like him. And so are you. So the goal of discipleship and community and the role of the church is to get you to become more like him, not to get you to look like the brand I'm trying to build. Right. Um, and that's hard to do for a lot of people because it's way easier to be a part of something bigger than myself and just go with the flow than to have to rediscover what God wants from me apart from people. Because that puts a responsibility and a weightiness to the fact that he's holding me accountable for me. He's not holding me accountable for resignation. He's holding me accountable for my heart, my mind, what I think about people, how I think about people, what I say about people. Um, the disordered desires that may come up in my life, how I respond to people when they think that maybe I am a heretic for starting a house church. Like God is so much more in tune and focused on that stuff, the hidden stuff, that the visible stuff doesn't matter that much. Like how many people come over to my house on a Friday? What worship song should we sing? All that stuff matters, but it doesn't matter most. Does that make sense? Um, okay. Here's a big one for you guys. Ready? Slow down, dude. Like, slow down. God is not anxious to get you to where he's never taken you, right? So if we think about it in the way of discipleship, um, Jesus' invitation is follow me. And when we follow him, we have to recognize that he's not anxious, Um to get us where we need to go. He's not in a rush to get us where we need to go. Um, in fact, he's not in fear of us missing it. Um, he's just present. Like Jesus in our ability to be formed to his image and our maturity and growing to become like him is very, very present, which means he's not rushing me to get ahead. Um, because in Jesus's mind, if it, it, it does no good for my soul and my family and our house church or whatever it may be, relationships I have, if I end up in a place having missed the whole journey getting there and not learning the lesson and growing in character and ability, and I just get there, and then when I get there, I destroy all of it because I don't know how to handle it. So for us, it's recognizing like, we need to slow down and recognize just like Jesus is 18 years of silence, our maturity and character, it's going to take time to develop. It's going to take time, but we can trust the fact that we can give him time. We can give the one who sits outside of time, time to help us grow. Does that make sense? Um, and I think this is a theme in my life is that stop focusing on doing stuff for God. We're, we're very um, performance driven in the Western church. So we, we place an emphasis on do, 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 do. Um, I mean, from missions to events to um, vision and whatever it is that we're building, we're so 
infatuated with doing, doing, doing stuff for God that we never learn how to become like him. And doing does not equal becoming. Nobody, nobody that is um, living in a life of sin right now says, you know what? I'm just going to do all the Christian stuff and then I'll become like Jesus. No, 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 no. You become like Jesus in order to, to do the stuff Jesus did. So the priority that we have to put on ourselves in our growth is that being with God, becoming like God matters more to God than doing stuff for God. Right. Does that make sense? Um, and one pastor told me one time, he said, um, to be a disciple is to move away from conviction and consecration to captivation. Meaning that I don't live my life like I have to set myself apart for such a time as this, or I have to fast for 36 days and, and, and moving to just the place of, I wake up and I'm like, Lord, you're so beautiful. Like, thank you so much for who you are. Like, there's nothing that I could do to add to you. And yet you've partnered with me in covenant um, in the earth for, for this time. Like moving to the place where we're, we're captivated about being and becoming like him, that the last thing I'm thinking about is, you know, how I need to, you know, whip myself into shape. If that makes sense. You know, my children don't grow as my children because I just beat them all day. <laughs> in fact, if, if, if the way in which sometimes I treat my children, like how I approach God, like God, just like discipline me, get me set in order, do all these things. I'd probably be arrested for like child abuse, right? <laughs> like people would be like, you're not that great of a parent, but somehow it's like, but we perceive God to be like that. So we know that he wants us to become like loving people and all that stuff. But we think somehow he has to like beat us into fruition when his way is like um, transformation is the byproduct of repentance. And repentance is the recognition that he's good. Like, like we, it's not like repent and see he's good. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance, which leads us to transform. Um, and then my last thing I would say is um, how we grow. I know I didn't get on the whole church thing, but we'll talk. Um, is you create a habit and you just keep doing it again and again and again. Repetition equals formation. So your ability to wake up early and spend time with him and pray. Or what about this? Ready for spouses? Future husbands. Um, this is my, this is free advice for you. You can tie to me later. Um, if you learn how to serve your spouse in a way um, that becomes a habit of like speaking affirmation, validation, um, becoming a man of like service, serving her. If you see it, like it's simple. Like if you see her, you know, in her room with a cup and it's almost you know empty saying, Hey, can I fill this for you? If you learn how to do that and make a habit of it, you'll, you'll recognize that the byproduct of your repetition is that your life and marriage is becoming transformed. It's not like, Hey, remember that one time I did that one thing for you? Why haven't you changed? It's the constant growing and effort that we give and make with our spouse that actually transform them and us and our marriage. And so the same thing with the Lord, like to grow into his image is to, what do you think Jesus did for 18 years? He probably just did the same thing. He worked, he prayed, he fasted, you know, he celebrated who the father was during certain feasts and celebrations. He probably practiced Sabbath. He had spiritual disciplines and he didn't have to talk about it. He didn't parade himself around the community and say, look at how awesome I am. His repetition became his formation. And when his formation got to the place where he could be trusted, the father said, it's time. Like, and so we see the Cana scene, like it's time, right? Um, and I would say last thing is that if it's true transformation, your neighbors will be able to see it, which means that you don't get to walk around saying how awesome and transformed you are your neighbors will recognize like you're not the same person anymore. And that's the goal of Christianity. 
Like if we're, we're to say, why are we Christians? Well, it's the same commission that Israel had. It's to become a holy nation of priests who embody what purity and righteousness look like amongst pagan nations so that pagan nations will draw near to our God. Like that's the entire commission of Israel is I'm going to set you guys apart from Egypt. I'm going to give you new laws, new ways of living, a new ethic for how to love people well. Um, and you're going to, and you're going to consecrate yourself. You're not going to be common. You're going to be uncommon people. And Israel was never to take that as like a pride thing. We don't really think about that. Israel was a prototype for the nations. Like Yahweh's heart was to get the nations, but they, they fumbled the ball per se. And the nations missed out because of their mishandling. So eventually God, what does he do? He goes around his own people and says, I'm going to go for the Gentiles to stir up my people that they would come home. So the goal for us is we have to be transformed in our way of following him because God is looking to captivate the nations with our life, not with our church service. There's a difference, not with our 501c3. God is actually looking to our life to tangibly speak to the nations around us.